Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to, have you, wonderful to have you here on this gorgeous Sunday morning. And thank you to our online friends for joining us as well. It is uh, week two of our season of creation, and today we are celebrating the land. Now, who, who was... Oh, it was John who was the last one. And John, you get to light the candle and pour the water. <laughs> a light last week, so yeah. make sure you have it the right way. God, light of the world. Jesus, living water of life. Holy Spirit, power divine, we praise your holy name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you. And will you please join with me in our uh, acknowledgement of traditional territory. For thousands of years, indigenous people have walked in this land on their own country. Their, their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe. Specifically, the Chippewa, Ojibwa, and Potawatomi, past, present, and emerging leaders. We also respect their spirituality and stewardship of this land throughout the ages. May we promise and challenge ourselves to make truth and reconciliation real in our community of faith here and in our daily lives. The Thune and Knox United Churches are a safe place for all people to worship regardless of your race, creed, age, cultural background, or sexual orientation. May we honor one another and honor life itself. Are there any announcements or joys, concerns you would like to share with us this day? Okay, well, I have a couple for you. Bruce. Terry, oh, sorry, Bruce, go ahead. Okay, you go first. I'll follow. Next Sunday is Terry Fox Sunday, so feel free to wear your sneakers and any Terry Fox uh, t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats or anything like that that you might have. And we will also be taking up a special offering for the Terry Fox Foundation. And then the Sunday after that is a service, a combined service in, where are we going? Port Sydney, <laughs> for the Beanbag Baseball Spectacular. Mm -hmm. So it's the World, World Series of Beanbag <coughs> Baseball. So we'll be doing that <laughs> over there. And we'll be potluck, so because you're traveling, you bring the desserts, and Knox will provide the, the first course for you. Bruce. Uh, thanks, Sue. Uh, maybe if Michael can adjust the uh, shot of the camera. Uh, during this past week, I had a, a guest drop off a poster that you hopefully will see over here. And um, it was acquired through some kind of a, a, an antique shop, or perhaps a gathering, to do with antiques. The poster struck his attention because it identified Baysville as an activity place. And you can see the information. The uh, music was provided by the uh, swing stylists. <laughs> what we weren't able to decide is the kind of timing in, in year <coughs> may have been. And so playing around on the computer, it may have been in the mid to late 40s. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, Maybe if we can identify that, and maybe some other information. Maybe there are people who are still around who may have attended that kind of a dance. We could have this posted at the library where everybody could revel in. I remember. <laughs> if you can. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> Michael's going to try and post this on Facebook, and, um, and maybe then if somebody out there in the big world sees it and has knowledge of any part of what that might represent. Make contact, please, and maybe we can share it with as many people as possible. You have to talk to Alex. Well, yeah. Yeah, I thought about that, too. Yeah, there's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Well, the Lake of Bays community group on Facebook publishes this kind of stuff a lot. Did it? it? Sure. Oh, yeah, and okay. somebody will know. Like, yeah. Marco Sherry McKinnon knows a lot. That's <laughs> 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 Where, where the bakery is. Yeah. Was, 
Good swing dance, that's for sure. Thank you. I want to welcome you to the season of this, to everyone to this uh, gathering as we uh, move again into the season of creation. The season of creation is a special time that recognizes God's wonderful creation and affirms our kinship with everything God has created and is still creating. The season of creation is also a time for us to, that reminds us of how we are an important part of the whole creation cycle and can do much to care and sustain the environment on both the local and global level. So our focus this week is on the land, and I have presented you with a little pot of soil, and uh, <laughs> uh, we'll move into that a little later in the service. So let us begin with our gathering hymn, verse 2 of It's a Song of Praise to the Maker. seems to have changed. We gather to worship. Find us, O God, shaped by the dust, grounded in hope and eager to grow. You are with us. Let us pray. Listen, land is inviting us in. She joins us to join in her deep song deep within the earth. Land cries out from the ground. There is grief in her song, but there is a rhythm of hope. Listen. We are not separate. Our hearts beat together as one. Where could we go from spirit? Nowhere. Nowhere. God is under our feet. God is over our heads. God is here as we pray together saying, Our God, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So I presented you with a soil sample when you came in. And I invite you to rub it between your fingers and share with the person next to you. Or if you don't want to share with your spouse, feel free to turn around and share with someone else. And uh, I want you to relay to the person that you're speaking with a special story or a memory of soil uh, or of the paddocks of the wild creatures in this country. Things that have touched soil and, and just your, your memories of it. If you're a farmer, it might be of tilling, tilling your fields. If you're uh, 
go back to your childhood when you would be digging in the dirt looking for worms or whatever it was that you were doing, but something that you did with dirt.
came shining and I was strolling and the wheat fields waving and the dust clouds rolling as the fog was lifting a voice was chanting this land was made for you and me this land is yours <laughs> we move now to our scripture readings for today. And so may we open ourselves to the seeds of wisdom that lie dormant in this reading. And may our minds be fertile soil in which it may grow strong and true. Our responsive psalm this morning is based on Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. And if you follow in the hymn book, it's number 861. chapter 
chapter 4, 9 through 16. Then the Lord God said to the snake, You will be punished for this. You alone of all the animals must bear this curse. From now on you will crawl on your belly, and you will have to eat dust as long as you live. I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head, and you will bite her offspring's heel. And he said to the woman, I will increase your trouble in pregnancy, your pain in giving birth. In spite of this, you will still have desire for your husband, yet you will be subject to him. And he said to the man, You listened to your wife and ate the fruit which I told you not to eat. Because of what you have done, the ground will, under you will be a curse. You will have to work hard all your life to make it produce enough food for you. It will produce weeds and thorns, and you will have to eat wild plants. You will have to work hard and sweat to make the soil produce anything. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to, in the field. And then when they were out in the fields, Cain t turned on his brother and killed him. And the Lord asked Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He answered, I don't know. Am I supposed to take care of my brother? Then the Lord said, Why have you done this terrible thing? Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground like a voice calling for revenge. You are placed under a curse and can no longer farm the soil. It, was soaked with, uh, with, it has soaked up your brother's blood as it has opened its mouth to receive it when you killed him. If you try to grow crops, the soil will not produce anything, and you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, This punishment is too hard for me to bear. You are driving me off the land and away from your presence. I will be a homeless wanderer on the earth, and anyone who finds me will kill me. But the Lord answered, No, if anyone kills you, seven lives will be taken in revenge. So the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who met him not to kill him. And Cain went away from the Lord's presence and lived in a land called Wandering, which is east of Eden. Fear bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. Dirt is a deep source of life, grounding, nurturing, sustaining, and hosting living things. The same microorganisms that support life on some, for some can be deadly to others. Genesis reminds us we come from and will return to dust. But many of us spend that time, the time in between, doing our best to eliminate dirt and dust from our lives. What are some of your experiences of land, earth, and dirt? Soil. <laughs> well, Michael. Oh, <laughs> I have a funny story about it. Um, when our oldest was very tiny, we went to uh, Meaford on or uh, Wasega Beach uh, on the south shore of Georgian Bay. And it, it was a windy day, and if you know that area, it's all sort of uh, shingle rock running out into the bay, um, quite cold. And so we were all bundled up, but we were sitting there on the beach having lunch and just uh, enjoying ourselves. And then we heard this horrific grinding sound, and we looked all over trying to figure out what it was. And uh, Liz, had picked up a rock and was chewing on it. <laughs> <laughs> and just the echo sound in her mouth was incredible. And we could not believe that all of that noise was coming out. I guess well, she was teething at, teething at the time. But just grinding away on this, <laughs> I guess, relatively soft rock. And it was incredible. <laughs> and it made me think of the, uh, you know, the expression, you'll eat a peck of dirt. Yeah. Yeah. Parents used to, or grand, grandparents used to tell their grandchildren, and well on her way. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. If you got kids and, and animals like dogs and pets, you've always got dirt. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I was telling Nancy one of my earliest memories of, other than trying to dig to China mm -hmm. with a you know a tablespoon <laughs> beside my grandma's house, she had a massive garden, and I would always help her in the garden when I when I was there in the summer. And so she would be digging up potatoes, and I, my job was to take the potatoes and put them in the basket, but every time I put a potato in the basket, I wiped my hands. Grab a potato basket, wipe my hands. And she just thought that was the craziest thing. She said to me, why, why don't you just wait? <laughs> oh, I don't like to wait. <laughs> I guess if we take time to reflect on the experiences, positive and negative, of 
lots of negative ones that we can think of, but the positive part, certainly for people who are gardeners, um, it comes to mind. Think of the absolute joy, the pleasure, the relaxation, the, the stimulation, in fact, of being in the garden with flowers and vegetables, even grass that we have to mow. Turns out to be something very positive. It's, it's healing to be involved. And maybe that's what we have to take out of our understanding of birth and how we relate to it. Absolutely. I never had a green thumb. I was a disappointment to my father, but I'd always say, I love a garden with clean dirt. <laughs> 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 I didn't care if they had flowers or they didn't just so well if the dirt was clean. Nice. I've got an infomercial. The week after next, the international flowering match is going to be out in Dufferin County, first time ever, and uh, we expect about 80,000 people to descend on Dufferin County. It's the largest event of that kind in North America, and it's, it's uh, every year it's a new setup. You can appreciate what it's like to put a, set up a whole city or small town in about two weeks. And uh, ostensibly, it's uh, to have a plowing match, but it's really a celebration of agriculture and rural living. And we, I invite you all there. And uh, as a former school teacher, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children will be bussed in to learn how, how, where their food comes from and the role of soil in producing our livelihood, and probably goes back to Cain and Abel. Absolutely. Thank you, John. That's a great commercial. Yeah. Well, let us move now to our Ministry of Music, which was recently um, given to us by Michael and Nancy. partner with your creative spirit in bringing life to its fullness and flourishing. Amen. Amen. What I mentioned earlier is that what I enjoy about the season of creation is that it is an intentional time to consider the role of creation in Bible stories and in our everyday lives. Sometimes we overlook the beauty that surrounds us 
and forget to remember that we are humans, that we humans are just one part of this unfolding story of God's creation. Our scriptures today invite us to reconnect with our special and ongoing relationship with land and with earth. In our scripture from Genesis today, the Bible begins with the story of land, who many, including the scholar Bridget Call, describe as a character. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve find that their confused actions over the tree of knowledge of good and evil has transformed the relationship with earth. Land no longer gives food to Adam easily. And Adam and Cain's son kill, kills, Adam and Eve's son Cain kills their other son Abel. And here, land comes forth as a witness, crying to God of Abel's blood. And just as the first humans have a relationship with God and other creatures, they also have a relationship with earth their mother. Adam's very name means earth creature in Hebrew. The first humans learned something we know well today in the era of climate change, that we can hurt or heal our land with our actions. So we talk of land as a character, a mother as well as a witness. Land, I'm sure, can certainly feel the effect of extinction of plants and animal species. Land must certainly feel what we do in waste dumps and on fields of war. Land must certainly feel what we do when we cut down our rainforests or drain our wetlands. That is a lot of suffering for our land. However, as we emerge from our worship of the forest from last week, we are able to notice the ground beneath our feet. It's challenging to acknowledge how our broken relationship with God relates to our sense of land, even though Genesis reminds us that we are created from dust. And on that note, that's why I don't dust anymore. <laughs> it might be someone I know. <laughs> But seriously, we do try to eliminate dirt and dust from our lives, denying its life-giving power and imagining that God is far away from the ground. So we seek to reclaim, reclaim that connection by listening closely to land and paying attention to the song land might be singing. Indigenous people know land song and sing along. So I would like to share with you this writing entitled our home in treaty land, walking our creation story by Matthew Anderson and Raymond Aldred. This is what they write. Jesus and the land relationship between the people of the land and the creator will again and again remind us that we are, there are many examples of indigenous people who seeing the invisible attributes made plain and around them in creation gave thanks to the creator just as the writer of the Epistle to the Romans points out, for a creator's invisible attributes have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Although I am not sure this is the best passage because the writer of Romans seems to assume that no one gets the right understanding about the creator, I like the story of Abram, Abram and Melchizedek which is found in Genesis 14, 18, 12. Here's a person who knows the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even before there was an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Melchizedek is an indigenous priest who is in the land, even before Abraham is the land. Again, indigenous people understand the creator who inhabits the world and now has come close in the Jesus who takes a body, or should I say, is given a body by Mary. That Jesus was in the land is important for the first peoples because it fits with the idea that the land was sacred. Sacred, as anthropologists and other academics use the term, refers to something that is not ordinary or profane, but is special or, 
or has a special or sacred status. This division can work, but not quite the way that it works in some Western churches. <clears throat> in the Western church, they make something sacred, and then it is always sacred, and must be kept from the profane. It seems to be that it seems to be thought that if something profane touches the sacred, it becomes unsacred or ordinary. Indigenous people have preferred to regard all things as sacred because at any point in time, Creator could do something powerful within creation, and that powerful working makes a place sacred. Often we journey to these sacred places because something powerful happens there. Indigenous peoples, then, in anticipation of Creator doing something powerful, maintain an attitude of awe and anticipation, trying to understand the movement that is all around and within which we live our lives. The journey upon the land, then, is put into stories, songs, and ceremonies that remind us and help us to understand the journey upon the earth. When the story of Jesus was preached, the story of his coming was taken into our stories and into the indigenous Christ tabernacles. He sets up his tents in our midst. So my friends, let us remember then that land is a friend with whom we sojourn with each step of our journey here on this earth. Amen. Let us join in singing Touch the Earth Lightly, number 307. Today's title is Providing Tuition Assistance. Hamden wants to become a doctor someday. As the oldest son, this young teenager dreams big amidst the daily struggles that he and his family face. Hamden's family came to Lebanon several years ago to escape the war in Syria. They can barely afford their monthly rent, food, household expenses, clothing, and medical needs. While his father works in a produce shop, his mother stays at home to care for the family's four children and two other family members. This family of eight lives on the father's pay and a small income supplement they receive from the UN. Like Hamden, many children in Lebanon are at risk of losing their education because of an economic crisis intensified by the COVID pandemic and the devastating 2020 explosion of Beirut has plunged their families into poverty. When parents can't pay school tuition, 
Children face an unstable future. The Middle East Council of Churches assists Lebanese children or er, students and Syrian refugees ages 8 to 13 with tuition and fees to secure their education and prevent them from becoming a lost generation. One thing Hamden's parents don't have to worry about anymore is his education. With tuition assistance provided by Middle East Council to Hamden and his siblings, they can continue to study until graduation and gain an entrance into a university, giving Hamden a chance to achieve his dream. Your support through Mission and Service helps remove barriers for teenagers like Hamden so they can work toward their dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. My friends, God has blessed each and every one of us in so many different ways. And we thank you for your offerings which are upon the plate, those which come through par, and for all that you give just through being yourselves and the work and energy that you put not only into our church here, but into our community and, and outlying areas. So thank you so much for all of that. We are truly blessed. and our fears. We bring our hands, our hearts, and our tears. Amen. Well, I'd like to share with you now Jim Carter's version of the prayer that Jesus taught. It draws on the imagery and invites us into a deeper appreciation and longing for justice for the land and for the whole of creation. So I hope you can read it. It's up there on the slides. So let us pray together. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing... You okay? That's all. Oh, okay. Well, I'll keep going for you. The hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trial too great to endure, spare us. And from the grip of all that is evil, free us. For your reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Well, let's join in singing hymn number 844. And it's a quick little um, hymn, You Shall Go Out With Joy, so we'll sing it twice. Get your flappers ready.
Tremble softly in anticipation of the Spirit's presence. Transform each life with love in every time and place. Amen. Amen. Indigenous Guardians, Caring for the Land, you may find that on Facebook. So go out with your heads high, hearts open, wishing love to everyone that you meet. Have a wonderful day and week, and until we meet again, know that you're held in the palm of God's hand.